Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about mainly about this uh, new painting, which appeared last year. And I will well, say something about all the scenes. Now, oh, sorry. So the title of my lecture is uh, Picture Version of the Manichaean Kefala here, well, with question mark. Uh, well, I shall talk, uh, explain why I would like to call it a picture version of Manikya and Kefala here later. Uh, my uh, lecture consists of well, several parts. First, I introduce uh, the new discovery, and then uh, I will say something about the component of the uh, new painting. And uh, in the last part, I should like to say something about the new Chinese Manichaean text recently discovered in China and the uh, well, relationship with, uh, in connection with uh, uh, my paintings. Uh, let us see at first the brief uh, history of the Chinese Manichaeism. Uh, well, it entered China, well, the uh, earliest record is 694 when Fu Dodan, uh, after Dan Bishop, uh, presented uh, the sutra or text El Zong Jing, uh, the book of the two principles. It is uh, generally regarded uh, the Chinese version of the Mani's work called Shabragan. Shabragan is a Middle Persian text which produced by Mani to teach his doctrines to the Sasanian emperor Shabur. That is why it is called Shabragan. Uh, and then after that, obviously, you know, Chinese Manichaean scriptures were produced. And later in 732, an imperial degree was issued and the, the Manichaean religion was banned for the Chinese but not for uh, Shi Hu, uh, literally Western Hu or barbarians. It means, I think, it, uh, Iranians. And then, uh, uh, 763, the Uyghur Kagan was uh, converted to Manichaeism, and uh, he ordered, he asked the Chinese emperor to uh, build uh, several Manichaean temples in China. And uh, then in 843, uh, after Uyghur was collapsed, uh, China began to, began to pass, pass, persecute uh, Manichaeism, and uh, it was very severe. Uh, it happened in 843. And uh, because you know, they were not able to survive in North, northern China, one Manichaean monk named Hu Lu escaped and came down to Fujian. Or Fuju. And uh, from there, Manichaeism prevailed northward up to Zijan, uh, Zhejiang, and where Nimbo, the uh, capital of uh, Nansun, was located. And during Nansun and Yuan period, Manichaeism flourished in southern China. And one text, Son Hui Yao Ji Gao, which is a very famous record. Uh, no less than 40 churches in just one county of Wenju at, at that time. Uh, uh, well, when uh, 1120. And uh, during the Yuan dynasty, Manichaeism was not persecuted because, you know, Mongolians were more open-minded. <laughs> and uh, it is known that Marco Polo met Manichaeans in Fuju. According to Marco Polo, in all southern China, there were 700,000 households held the Manichaean religion at that time. Well, it seems to be an exaggeration, but still, you know, the Manichaeism was very flourishing in uh, southern China during this time. And then uh, we, we have uh, very meager survival from this period. And there's uh, one very famous uh, money portrait, uh, uh, you know, sculpture of money in Cao An, in Zhuanzhou. Uh, this is the uh, map. So this is Zhuanzhou and Fuzhou and then Wenzhou and uh, Ningbo and 
so on. And uh, this is a map I cited from uh, Dujana Gurati's book. Uh, the Uigo asked the Chinese emperor to build uh, Manichaean temples here in Taiwan, Chang'an, Luoyang, and several other places in southern China. And this is a famous uh, money uh, built in 1339, still in Mongolian period. And then it uh, comes to uh, the recent discoveries of Manichaean paintings uh, in Japan. Uh, well, it was <laughs> first discovered in 2007. And uh, at first, uh, I discovered uh, this painting, which is I called uh, individual eschatology, uh, because you know uh, here there is a judgment scene, and uh, uh, here the hair, and uh, here the heaven, and in between there is a human world. After the judgment, the human soul is uh, either go to heaven or be born again as a human being or will go to hell. And this is uh, the so-called Diana, who will uh, lead uh, the diseased soul to the heaven. And here, in between, we have the representation of money. Uh, he wears a white robe, and he sometimes takes, uh, with his left hand, the uh, end of the robe in this way. In this painting, we have an uh, inscription here. Uh, unfortunately, the date part is broken, and so we do not know the exact date. But here, it names uh, this painting was dedicated to Bao Shan Zai Yuan, uh, literally Jewel Mountain Vegetarian Temple. And the painting itself is called Ming Wan Shen Zhen. Uh, the sacred painting of the king of Hades. And this is uh, Diana again. And uh, this is a uh, representation of Manichaean Jesus. Uh, this painting has been possessed by uh, Arinobu, uh, Arima Harunobu, who was a, a Christian daimyo or a feudal Lord. And you know, this was among his possession. And uh, in 2006, uh, Professor Takeo Izumi studied this painting and he concluded that it, this is a Nestorian painting. But because it has got a very special the so called uh, segmenta, which are peculiar to uh, Manichaean apostles uh, and uh, church leaders. Uh, so it must be a Manichaean painting. And so later it was, sorry, uh, identified as a Manichaean Jesus. And then uh, I discovered this uh, nice painting, which is a representation of Manichaean cosmos. I call it cosmology. Together with it, uh, several other paintings were discovered. Uh, in this painting, money started to go somewhere by ships. And he landed in that land, and he proclaimed his religion. And finally, his uh, mission was successful, and local people uh, believed manichaeism, something like that. I call it uh, hagiography. Uh, but actually, it's a, Manichaean chart history or Mani Bita. Uh, this is another piece of some kind. Here is Mani and he is proclaiming his religion to the Buddhist monks. And uh, together with them, uh, there are small pieces, two pieces are discovered, which I call it uh, realm of light because it be uh, depicts the realm, uh, realm of light. And there are two pieces, and two pieces are joinable. <coughs> and later, uh, yet another uh, painting appeared, not appeared, but you know, it was published uh, in 
1937 uh, before war. And at that time, it was uh, published as a uh, Taoist uh, deity or something like that. And uh, unfortunately, we do not know the present about uh, where it is now. <coughs> and uh, it is clear, it is uh, the representation of money. He holds in this way, his, the, we have four segments here. It's a pity that it is uh, almost completely preserved, but still we do not know where it is. And then, uh, 2011, uh, this painting appears. And, uh, well, I call it Money's Bus because, uh, well, it's, it's just a baby. It comes from uh, this woman's chest and uh, there are several uh, deities here, and here's baby again. Obviously, it looks like uh, Buddha's bath scene. And uh, last year, I published a book uh, comprising, uh, publishing all the uh, photograph, photographs of, of the old paintings, and uh, together with my uh, and my colleagues' uh, articles about them. Uh, in this year, uh, Jujana Gurachi, uh, who is now teaching at uh, Northern Arizona University, uh, the specialist of Manichaean painting, published uh, this book, Mani's Pictures. In this book, she, well, possibly you know, she discussed what the Mani's original pictures looked like, and in so doing, he, she also uh, discussed uh, our Japanese Manichaean paintings. And uh, one of the uh, astonishing discovery by her is what I call the right piece is joinable to the main cosmology painting. And as a whole, it now becomes complete uh, representation of Mani's cosmos now. It's a heaven, we have heaven here, we have hair here, and in between 10 heaven and uh, moon and sun and so on. And then, after I, I published my book, there appeared another piece, in, uh, one in Tokyo, and I published it, uh, my article about it in uh, this year, and uh, another one appeared in California, USA. Uh, this is what I discovered in Tokyo, and this is the top, main topic of uh, my lecture today. The other one is this, which appeared in uh, California. And the scholar, Miki Morita, who is a Japanese uh, scholar, called, uh, you know, uh, think this is again Manichaean painting, and there's no doubt about it. And uh, it is so similar to the Mani's bath scene. So there's no doubt about it. But uh, she thinks that this, well, there are a couple, I mean, a female and male here. And so she argues that they are the uh, money's parents. And in front of the parents, money is standing. And just before, she, she, he started his missionary work. But it seems to be odd because, you know, he, if that is the case, the man should wear a white robe. So it seems to me this uh, is a depiction of uh, a man is, uh, how to say, before bus. I call it an annunciation of money because uh, the uh, Mani's mother is lying here, and there comes someone who obviously <laughs> prophesying the birth of Mani and so on. And in any case, uh, I think you know it is a new Manichaean painting. So uh, then let's uh, see my painting, or well, new painting. I call it. Uh, Hagiography 3 or Church History 3 or uh, picture version of Kefaraya. 
And uh, Kefara yeah, is, uh, well, we have <laughs> Professor Taudu here, and it's difficult to say something about this book <laughs> in front of him. But anyway, uh, Kefara is a Coptic uh, Manichaean uh, book, uh, and it recalls the discourse between Mani and his disciples. We have two uh, Kefara years. One is so-called Berwin Kefara year. It has already been published, more or less. And the contents of this Kefara year is more doctrinal. But there is another Kefara year, which is, called, which is now preserved in Chester Beatty uh, Library in Dublin, and it is called Dublin Kefara year. It has not yet been published, but uh, Professor Tardew, uh, I think in 1988 or something, published an article about this text and that says that it's a very interesting text relating the history of the Sasanian Empire and, and so on. So uh, this text uh, is more historical. And uh, Manian, uh, Man, uh, his followers activities in the early history of the Manichaean church, in particular in the Sasanian Empire. And uh, uh, now the Australian Scala Gardner and the John Bedoon and uh, Jason Bedoon and Didi are preparing the edition. And uh, before that, they published their preliminary work, uh, well, preliminary report about this Dublin Kefara year, last year. This is a book. And in my mind, my new painting is, from the viewpoint of contents, it's very similar to <laughs> this text. That is why I call it a uh, picture version of the Kefara year. But how about the Chinese tradition? Did Chinese people know the Kefara year like literature in Chinese? It's seems to me that they knew that. I mean, uh, in the Dunhuan Chinese text, translated in 731, which is usually called Compendium, the Chinese title is Mani Guangfo Jiao Fa Yi Due. And uh, this is a, a summary of Mani, uh, Manichaean teaching. Then there is a, a section uh, about the scriptures. After giving the list of seven canonical work uh, written by Mani, together with his uh, picture book, there is one passage here. It says, uh, all these seven canonical scriptures paintings appeared when Mani was born. And after that, uh, there is such a remark. Mani preached and explained his doctrine for 60 years after his birth. His disciples recorded them together with the occasions. However, they are not listed here. It seems to me that this is more or less like a Chinese version of the Kefala year. But, well, they <laughs> didn't say anything about this. So, well, let's... let's see more closely our painting. The size is, was 112 centimeters high, tall, and it has, uh, well, you have the uh, uh, color copy of the uh, painting. So it, is, it consists of three layers, I call it registers. And uh, it seems to me the first two registers are connected. The other one is not connected. And the uh, first register is like this. In this part, Mani and his disciples are here. And in front of him is a lady who looks very nice. I mean, I think he's, she's either princess or queen. Uh, followed by his maidens and uh, followers. <coughs> and obviously, Mani is teaching to her. And uh, uh, the second, uh, this is uh, the first, and second register is uh, something like this. Uh, there is a big mansion or a big house uh, surrounded by a tall wall. And in the uh, house, there is a 
uh, well, I think the lady is depicted here again and here as well. And outside the wall, there's a Mani and his followers. And in front of him is uh, uh, someone who, uh, well, uh, obviously they are ladies, wearing a white robe and uh, floating in the air. So, well, it seems to me uh, depicts the scene when the well, royal lady, either princess or queen, were, was converted to manichaeism. And who can it be? <laughs> I do not know, well, as far as I can see, uh, there's no record which money converted a, a princess or a queen. But there's one st story about uh, Shabur Duft, uh, who was uh, uh, Bafram's uh, wife. And there's a story that, um, well, money lost his favor from Bafram because he was not able to cure, heal Shabur Duft. So it means that it seems to me that you know Mani was had contact with Shabur Ducht, and uh, I wonder if it is a scene <laughs> where she uh, he uh, uh, was teaching this Shabur Ducht. And well, in this scene, well, well, maybe this lady is, is saying something to his uh, to her uh, maiden, and then. In this part, he, she is confronted with a deity from whom uh, these uh, light streams are coming out, like a rainbow. And here uh, we have another scene. It seems to me that she is going to die, and she was uh, you know, welcomed by uh, Diana, who will take her soul to uh, heaven, and before going to heaven, <laughs> my, my idea, of course, <laughs> she comes to say goodbye to money. And, uh, well, I think this is uh, such a scene. And uh, the reason why I identify her as Diana, uh, she wears a uh, typical uh, headgear, and if we see uh, the Diana's headgear here, it's something like this, and uh, another representation of Diana here, he, she is wearing a certain headgear. So well, it seems to me that this is a scene when she is going to die. So, uh, First and second register uh, depict the, the stories about uh, the queen or princess conversion to manichaeism and her death. And what else uh, in the first register? The left half of the first register consists of these four squares. And as far as I can see, there's no connection with the uh, uh, the scenes to the right. I mean, uh, they are four independent scenes. And, <laughs> well, it is almost clear because you know, here we have a very famous story. We have uh, elephant here, there's a tree here, he's hanging on the branch and there is two mice, black mouse and white mouse, and here is a well and four snakes here, and there's a dragon. It's a very famous story. So uh, it seems to me that the other three are also parables of similar kind. So uh, the left half consists of four independent scenes evidently having no connection with the story represented in the right half. The among the four, the one on the lower left, can easily be identified with a parable named the man in the well, well known in Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. One version from the Buddhist Chinese text, uh, this text, uh, reads as follows. Once upon a 
time, a man, while traversing a desert, saw himself pursued by a furious elephant. He was seized, by a, by, uh, seized with uh, fright and knew, no, knew not where to find a refuge when he perceived a dry well near which grew the long roots of a tree. He seized those roots and let himself glide down into the well. But two rats, uh, one black and the other white, gnawed together the roots of that tree. At the four sides of the tree, there were four venomous snakes which endeavored to bite him, and beneath there was a dragon uh, gorged with poison. In the depths of his heart, he equally feared the dragon's poison, the serpent's, and the breaking of roots. There dwelled on that tree a swarm of bees, which made five drops of the honey, honey trickle down into his mouth. That is a, uh, one story from the Buddhist text. Unfortunately, our uh, painting is, we can't see bees. Maybe they eroded or now lost, I'm, I'm not sure. But, well, there are, of course, <laughs> this is a story, the religious story, and so there are some allegory of it. Uh, some explanation is the tree and the desert figure the wrong night of ignorance. The, that man figures the heretics. The elephant figures the impermanence of things. The well figures the brink of life and death, and so on. I mean, uh, this story has some religious meaning. Uh, however, as far as I know, the parable, the man in the well, has not been attested in the Manichaean, uh, the Manichaean text, which we know now. But uh, this story is known in two Arabic books, which have something to do with Manichaeism. One is uh, Karira wa Dimna, uh, which was translated from Middle Persian to Arabic by Ibn al Mukaffa, who was a Manichaean. This Arabic version was translated into European language and becomes very famous. And the other, another uh, Arabic book uh, which contains the story the, of the man in the well is Kitab Bilau Har Wa Budasaf. The Christian version is Balram and Yuasaf. And uh, this is is also believed to be translated from a Manichaean text, which itself was uh, based on a commonly known tale about the life of the Buddha. That is, a, that is why we have Buddha here. Uh, the, the fact that Central Asian Manichaeans knew the book of Birauhal and Buddha Saf is inferred from the Manichaean Uyghur text of uh, the drunken uh, prince who makes a love with a, a corpse. Uh, this text is known in Manichaean Uyghur text, and uh, this story itself is also uh, contained in Kitab Bilao Wa Budasaf. So, uh, obviously, the story of the man in the well was known to the Manichaeans. So, well, uh, then Look, let's see what is the implication of this painting, where we have uh, the scene here. Uh, obviously, Mani told this parable while, uh, when she converted the noble lady. And uh, if you look at the uh, Manichaean texts concerning church history, there are several occasions Mani told parables uh, to the heretics. Uh, I cite one text uh, from uh, M48, Persian text, once edited by uh, Bernard Zundaman. In this text, uh, well, the, the English version reads as follows, whereupon the Lord Mani taught the Turan Shah much insight and wisdom. Turan Shah is a, a king of Turan, and, and Turan is a, <laughs> run between Iran and India, and the, I think it corresponds to what is now Baluchistan. 
uh, and he showed him paradise and hell, the purification of the world, sun and moon, soul and body, the apostles that had come into the land, righteous one and the sinners and the work of the elect and the auditors. Whereupon, when the uh, Turan Shah and the nobles heard this word, they became glad, accepted the faith, and uh, became well disposed towards the apostle and the religion. And when the Turan Shah was then broken apart, and he met brethren being led up, then the brethren paid their homage to the beneficent one, which is money, and the apostle, which is money, told the Turan Shah a parable. And then the parable begins. There was a man, and he had seven sons. When the uh, hour of death came, he called the seven sons. He said, break all of them together. None of them could do so. Then he loosened, and so on. Well, <laughs> this is a very famous story, and we can imagine what was the story. But in any case, uh, money in the early uh, history, of Manichaean missionary history, we see several occasions when Mani told the parables. Here again is uh, another one uh, from the uh, Manichaean <coughs> Sogdian text. But I, well, skip here, but anyway, it is a very similar situation. So uh, let's uh, see the implication of the present illustration again. Uh, since we have this painting, it seems to me that the man, the story of the man in the well was known to Mani himself. Well, <laughs> it is one uh, assumption. I'm not sure whether it is true or not. But in but any case, you know, you, one can assume that Mani uh, was, uh, uh, knew the story. And uh, another one is... Uh, because we have uh, this uh, illustration of the parable here in this Manichaean painting, we may assume, we may allow to assume that uh, originally, in, even in Mani's picture book, there was a, a collection of uh, illustrations of the parables. And uh, fourth implication might be, you know, a scene of Mani's preaching is accompanied by illustration of power, uh, parables explained by him. I mean, uh, oh. Here, uh, money is, uh, the scene of money is teaching. And uh, here, obviously, they put the all, uh, four parables told by money here. And similar situation can be uh, seen in Buddhist uh, art object. Uh, this is from Nagarjuna Konda, and uh, uh, the, it was studied by uh, Monika Jin in her article, The Parable of the Man in the Well. It's traveled and it's pictorial tradition from Amaravati, Amaravati to uh, today. There are several uh, art objects in which Buddha is preaching, and he, Beside it, there is a, a scene of this parable, elephant and uh, man and uh, mouse, a uh, rat. And, uh, well, let's, let's see uh, several uh, scenes from the other religions. Well, it, I just, just cited from uh, Monica Jean's article. This is uh, the Islamic tradition. In the Islamic tradition, uh, elephant is changed to cam camel. In the Christian tradition, uh, the elephant is changed into uh, wolf or unicorn. But uh, th this is a Buddhist version, again, in southern, from southern China. Uh, it's very astonishing. This painting, it, uh, this is a, a block point, and it, it was sold during the 19th century, and this was bought by a, a Christian monk and published there. This is very similar to her painting. I don't know why. But, you know, all the other uh, representation, man is in the well. 
But in this case, man is uh, hanging from the uh, branch and uh, uh, well, th there are some, there must have been some connection between this southern Chinese version as we, and our Manichaean painting. And then we have, uh, now uh, we identify the, uh, one scene from the, uh, out of the four. And <laughs> can one identify uh, the other three as well? And, uh, well, uh, let us begin with this scene. <laughs> it is very straight. Uh, there's a pond, and man is walking, but as you see, if you look carefully, he is carrying a dog. And uh, he's holding dog's hind leg. And obviously, he's covering his uh, mouth, uh, with his sleeve, uh, well, you can see in, in the uh, uh, <laughs> uh, photocopy as well, if you have it. And, well, I don't know, of course, the story, <laughs> but uh, in one Manichaean uh, Sogdian text, 5030, there is a mention of a story where it says that, you know, like that story in which uh, a prince who, from whose neck was hung a dead body of a dog, and he is always wanting to throw it away. And obviously, there was such a parable, but we don't know what it is. And when I discussed this with my friend who is doing uh, Uyghur, uh, Buddhist Uyghur takes, he drew my attention to this wall painting discovered in Shikshin near Karashar. Uh, this is a Buddhist painting in which uh, there are monks, but there's one lay Buddhist and from he, his neck there's a depiction of a dog. Well, he doesn't know the story about this, but I don't either. But maybe it is also a Buddhist uh, uh, parable uh, which was borrowed into Manichaean, Manichaeism. And next one is, uh, uh, let's see, this one. Uh, in this case, you know, the box is open and uh, there comes two snakes and this man is obviously running away from uh, the snakes. Well, I don't know the story either, but in the Birau uh, Harat Budasaf, there is one such a story. In this story, it says that some thieves had arranged to enter the treasure house of the king in order to commit a theft. And they pierced the wall of the treasure house and entered, and they looked at objects the like of which they had never seen. And behold, they found a chest sealed with a gold with gold. So they said to one another, we cannot find anything which is better than this chest, which is made out of gold, sealed with gold, and whose contents will be even more beautiful than what we see. So they carried it and walked away with it until they entered some bushes. So none, for some of, none of them trusted the other. Then they opened it and behold, in it were snakes who jumped into their face and killed all of them. Well, the story is somehow similar. I don't know if it's the same story or not. And the last one uh, is this. For this, I have no idea. I mean, there's one horse and someone is observing this horse. But in this case, I should like to draw your attention to this very strange looking plant. This plant appears again in this scene, it is the same plant, and it appears once again in the new Manichaean painting discovered in California. Here it is it. And uh, when I wrote an article, I didn't know this flower or plant. And uh, the reader of the article told me that it must be uh, what is 
in Japanese it's called Hime Basho, which means Princess Banana. The, uh, <laughs> the name is, scientific name is Musa Kokinia, oh, I don't know. And place of origin is South China. And it, uh, it looks like this. And well, it's very strange that in, in the painting we have this uh, plant in, in church history. So in my opinion, in the original painting, this was another plant, flower. And well, I think the Chinese painter did not understand the plant and they exchanged it, the one which was familiar to them. And this was the, the, this Hime Basho, the princess banana. Uh, I skip this part. And then uh, I come to the third register. And here is the third register. This is the biggest one. And uh, this is it. And you have it in, with you, I think. Uh, in this third register, we have uh, Mani and his disciples here again. And he is... Uh, you know, uh, confronting with uh, seven people. One is kneeling. And in, as a whole, uh, apart from them, there are 41 beings. Uh, and more than 30 scenes are in this painting. And uh, there are some which are easy, can easily be identified. For, for example, this. Uh, this man is jumping towards a tiger. And, uh, well, I think, oh, sorry. Uh, this is, I think, is a scene of self-sacrifice. And uh, a scene, it's very famous uh, scene. It, in, it is known from the Mahasattva Jataka. Uh, this is Mahasattva Jataka, uh, the deep, uh, Dunhuang mural. Uh, this chap, this one, who wanted to help uh, rescue this hungry tiger, and he, uh, you know, threw him, uh, himself towards the uh, tiger, and eventually this tiger uh, ate him, and so on. So, uh, this is it. Uh, as a whole, I think uh, all these scenes are the practitioner of the uh, ascetics or uh, those who are heretics uh, of money's time. Uh, so let's see several other cases. There are one who is going into the fire. And, uh, oh, uh, let's see, here, uh, no, where is it? Ah, uh, here. Uh, well, it's a Ch Chinese style uh, Buddhist monk with tonsure and wearing Kashaya clothes. And uh, here we have someone who is wearing a uh, uh, deer skin, and uh, this one who is wearing a deer skin is a uh, norm. It is, uh, you know, muriga charing in the Sanskrit, and it, it, the Chinese counterpart is chan bei lu pi yi, literally meaning always wearing a deer skin as clothes. And in the Indian story, the muriga charing is living in the, with the deers and always together with his wife. And in our painting, here again, uh, one who is wearing a deer skin, and he, well, it is she, I mean, it is a female. And uh, so obviously in, in this painting, there is a depiction of uh, one Murigacharin uh, pairs. And well, what else? Uh, and well, there are several 
interesting scene here. Uh, this is obviously a merchant and uh, with worshipping a demon riding a, on a dark cloud. And this man is worshipping a female, but her body is snake. And uh, this is, uh, I think, called in Chinese is uh, new wa. So it seems to me that in this uh, third register, uh, they depict, well, this <laughs> represent the heretics of the money's time. And uh, <laughs> how many more can we identify? I'm sorry, I, I'm not competent enough to identify them. Uh, but if you see this one, he is uh, very funny, uh, reading a book, lying, but on his back we can see something. And if you look at a Buddhist text, uh, where there is a passage uh, listing several ascetics. And in, among them, there's one, uh, uh, what is that? Ah, here. Whose bed is on thorns? Obviously, he's lying on the thorns and reading books and so on. And there are uh, several people who are even half naked, uh, this one and uh, several others, these and these and so on. They very much look like Indian ascetics. And uh, well, then if we ask in this way, so can we find, for example, giant in this painting, or Zoroastrian here, or uh, Baptist, well, you know, Mani was the contemporary with Baptist and so on, and uh, several other. So if we see, uh, well, I'm not quite sure, this may be a giant, or, and here he's in the water, and maybe he's a uh, uh, a Baptist. And this one is living in the cave. And uh, here someone is going into the water and here is a fish here. And uh, well, apparently he is worshipping the dragon. And, and uh, I wonder the, they are the Russians because in front of them is uh, some altar like fire altar like thing and from there there is a uh, smoke is coming out but I'm not sure so uh, it seems to me the fourth register consists of uh, scenes or depiction of the uh, heretics of the money's time, uh, some of which we can identify, <laughs> some are, well, I cannot identify. But uh, let us ask in this way, this painting again has its roots in money's original painting or not? And if we see Middle Persian text M219, uh, there is such a passage. Uh, this is a very famous text, once studied by Henning, because there is a word nigar, it's a word for painting, and it is believed to be the word for money's picture book. Uh, the text said, listen, delicate human being, direct eye and face towards this and see how it is depicted here in front of you on this nigar. Idols, idol priests, altars, and their gods. Close my mind to impressions from them, blah, blah, blah. So, obviously, in Mani's uh, painting, there was a depiction of uh, idols and uh, other 
religion. So it is also possible, uh, I think it is possible that our painting, well, it, also, it, also it is uh, made during, the, I think, 14th century, uh, as other paintings, its root is, well, in the remote past, in Mani's uh, original painting. And uh, the last subject of my lecture today is the Sharpu text on Chinese Manichaean paintings. Uh, Sharpu is a place name uh, in the Fujian. And uh, since October 2008, a considerable number of Chinese Manichaean texts originating from Sharpu district, Fujian, in China, have come to light. These manuscripts have been kept by the descendant of local priests and many of the manuscripts seem to date back to the late Qin Dynasty or even to the early Republic period. So far, two aspects of these materials have been highlighted. One is to emphasize how faithfully they preserve the text they inherited from the Tang time. The other aspect of the sharp text highlighted by the Chinese scholars is how much these texts have been synthesized and have adopted elements of the local Chinese cultures and religions in particular Taoism. Many of the texts are collections of prayers called Keiben, a ritual manual and employed uh, for the in incantation and funeral ceremonies. So let us see uh, how faithfully this sharp Chinese text preserves the uh, original text. Uh, there is one sharp uh, Manichaean Chinese text called Mo Ni Guan Fo, uh, Mani the Light of Buddha. Uh, there is some uh, verses in Chinese, which of course originally translated from Middle Persian, Persian. If one compares this sharp text with uh, one text from Dunfan, uh, in Dunfan, we have a Chinese Madian text called Hymn Scroll, which I, is represented by H. Uh, it is a correction of the Chinese translation of uh, Middle Iranian hymns, Persian and Persian hymns. And if we compare two lines, you see almost the text, text is almost identical. So, well, they obviously for more than a thousand years preserved this text very carefully. And I find uh, this passage again in this Mani Guanghuo. It said Mani denounced his secular life in his age of four and when he was 13 years old he attained the enlightenment. And this uh, story about Mani is well, as far as I know, that it's not known, it's not attested, it's not, it's not found among the Middle Iranian texts discovered in Trufan or Chinese uh, Manichaean texts discovered in Trufan or Dunfan. But only here we have this passage. But this information is very accurate. Uh, we know it from Biruni and or from the uh, Greek text, uh, so-called Koronumani Codex. So obviously the, the people in Sharpu uh, preserved a very good knowledge of Mani's life. And I wonder if this information comes from the Chinese text uh, called El Zongjin, Book of the Two Principles. The Book of the Two Principles is uh, quite often inferred uh, referred, I mean, mentioned in connection with the southern Chinese Manichaeans. So obviously they knew this book, they preserved this book, and uh, as I said, that uh, this uh, El Zongjin is supposed to be the Chinese version of the Mani Shabragan, and in Mani Shabragan, Mani <laughs> talked about himself uh, when he uh, began his religious life or something like that. And, so obviously they preserved uh, this uh, information, get this information from this text. Uh, quite recently, among the Chinese 
fragment discovered in Turfan. Uh, this text was discovered by uh, Dr. Wang Ding. And uh, when I see this very nice manuscript, and it describes the manuscript cosmology, I wonder if this is a fragment of the Elzon Jin. I'm not sure, of course. Now, uh, let us see the relationship, connection between the sharp text and the Manichaean painting preserved in Japan. Uh, I think it is likely that the texts have been kept by local Manichaeans who were the descendants of those who produced Manichaean painting of the 14th century recently discovered in Japan. So uh, all these Shapu Manichaeans were descendants of the uh, Manichaeans of the 14th century who produced uh, the paintings. And in, again in Moni Guang Fo, uh, Shapu Manichaean text, there is uh, a text about Mani's bath. It is said Mani was born from the chest of Moyan, it is stand for Mariam. At that moment, golden lotus flowers emerged out of the earth, dew fell from the sky, all deities uh, were happy, while the three poisonous devils were worried and annoyed. And if we see uh, the Mani's bath scene here, uh, Mani was born from the chest of her, his mother, and lotus flower comes out from the earth and uh, uh, well, represent footsteps, of course. And sweet dews are, are coming from heaven and uh, all the deities are rejoicing, very glad, happy. And three demons were annoyed. We can see three demons here. So, Obviously, the, the text we find among the Shapu uh, material is, is agrees very well with this uh, painting. So, uh, then I come to the phonetic transcription of Middle Iranian <coughs> hymns in Shapu text. Uh, as I was, well, I'm a philologist and <laughs> I studied uh, the Chinese text uh, and transcri uh, transcribing Middle Iranian uh, hymns. And in so doing, I have been able to identify two hymns. One is uh, called Shi Ji Jian, a hymn of the four calmnesses or four quietnesses. And, well, it's, it's something to do with the four aspects of uh, Manichaean God. Uh, God, light, power, and wisdom. The Chinese Greek variant is Qin Jing Wan Min Dari Ji Hui. All these were t transcribed in, in, these, uh, in this way in Chinese characters in the Manichaean uh, text from Shapu district. So the transcription seems to be uh, accurate, not very accurate, but anyway accurate and, and based on the Middle Chinese pronunciation. And this is the manuscript of this uh, hymn. We have two manuscripts. And uh, this is one hymn which I have ab uh, able to identify. The other one is <laughs> the, uh, the text bilingual in uh, mi uh, Middle Iranian and Aramaic. Long ago, when I was a student at SOAS, uh, I, well, according following Nicholas Simzerum's advice, I studied uh, one Chinese Manichaean text discovered in Dunhuang and preserved in British Library. It is called Chinese Hymn Scroll. And uh, there are one hymn which, has not been, which had not been identified. And I studied this hymn, and finally I was able to discover that this hymn was not 
solved because it was bilingual in Aramaic and Middle Iranian. And I published uh, an article, very short article, 1983. But while I was uh, looking at the sharp text, I was astonished to discover yet another one in the Sharpo text. But this is the same hymn, but from the Fujian. And if I compare the two hymns, uh, the, how to say, the system of transcription is slightly different. And uh, <laughs> to my astonishment, Sharpo text represent older stage, while the Dunfan text uh, represent the uh, newer, later updated version. <laughs> I don't know why, but well, it seems to me that in late 7th century or early 8th century, the original transcription was made and this was preserved in Shapu. But in Dunfan, they were somehow updated uh, in in accordance with the change of the pronunciation of Chinese characters. Uh, so, well, in this case, Shapu takes to preserve the older stage than even the Dunfan text. So, uh, now we can, how to say, not imagine, but you know, we, it, it, we have come to the stage that what was the original Tan time uh, Manichaean scriptures and painting looked like? And uh, well, <laughs> we don't know. But as far as painting is concerned, here this is, uh, this is a piece discovered in Turfan. Uh, they are, uh, you know, pictures of uh, Manichaean nuns. Erecti, Thai. And well, their face, in my mind, looks very much like uh, what we find in Shosoin uh, uh, folding screen. Uh, we have it here in Shosoin, and this is Trufan. And they, well, in my mind, they are very similar. So this painting, I think, what well, is a, a kind of legacy from the Tan time paintings. And uh, then <laughs> how about the scriptures? Uh, as I was studying uh, one of Shapu texts, well, the Chinese people produce uh, one very small uh, talisman called Chu Sha Fu, talisman against an evil spirit. Uh, there is one line here and if I look at the line carefully, it looks like this. There's one character which is not known, and then Wu Ruoshan, representing Middle Iranian Ruoshan, right, and then comes another one representing Zawal, uh, power, and there comes GD, it must be the corrupt form of GD, a Persian word for wisdom. So, it must be a right power wisdom. So it must be, this part must represent God. But this character, it is consisting of uh, left part is Jen, truth, and the, the right part is Tian, meaning God. So this character, which is not known in any dictionary, must represent Manichaean deity. And we know the similar situation in the case of uh, Zoroastrianism. In the case of Zoroastrianism, in early 7th century, uh, they coined new character representing uh, Zoroastrian deity. It's uh, Xi'an. This is consisting of uh, this part, which meaning spirit, spiritual, and this part, again, God, heaven. It is known that this character was invented in the 7th century. Obviously, uh, sometime later, Chinese Manichaeans invented their own 
character which is consisting of uh, truth and heaven to represent their own God. But this character was totally eliminated from the dictionaries. And I think in the course of uh, persecution, the, something Manichaean was totally destroyed and uh, was, uh, wasn't able to reach us. Uh, so, I come to the conclu uh, concluding remark. Uh, considerable amount of the Manichaean scriptures and paintings seems to have been uh, existed in Chang'an, Luoyang, the well, central part of the Tang Empire during the Tang time, before 843 CE. And many, uh, when Manichaeism was severely, uh, well, and, well, until when Manichaeism was severely persecuted, the, the, there are quite a remain in Tan Tan uh, Tan, but they disappeared. And what we now find in Dung Fan, Tru Fan, Shapu, Japan are only meagre traces of the once flourishing religion. Oh. Thank you very much. <laughs>